interesting enough to get it using this kind of attack path. I mean, if there are ways um, to kind of get to the internals through a serial port or just desolder chip, then there's no point in trying to set up a side channel analysis. So only when the security of the device becomes such that these other attacks become more difficult, then it becomes an alternative. Okay, so how do you do this? How do you actually measure this and how do you set this up? So here's kind of a schematic of how uh, a typical side channel setup looks like. Basically, you start off with a workstation that kind of is the control center. Um, it needs to supply your target with the data it needs to operate on, or it should be able to sniff the data coming from the real protocol go in. Um, but it needs to get the data into the target. And in, in this case, the picture still shows kind of a smart card setup, but, but you could put uh, a set, an embedded system in there. And then every time you do a operation, like I'm encrypting something or decrypting something, you make sure you have a trigger signal that kind of makes sure that the oscilloscope takes a snapshot of the behavior just around that time that the operation is happening. And this can actually be quite tricky. So if you've got a hardware um, crypto engine that, that does it in a few hundred nanoseconds, you have to be pretty fast and accurate um, to capture the right moment in time. And then, of course, you need to get all your data back into your workstation where you can align and, and, and couple the, the data that you used for the measurement, the measurement itself, uh, and then finally do all the processing steps that you need to do to get this, uh, these results. So what are prerequisites? Well, first of all, of course, you need access to the side channel. Um, and electromagnetic, for instance, is a bit easier because it's like a field around the device. But power, it may be uh, quite um, some work, especially for an embedded device. Uh, a smart card is pretty simple because it has these contacts and it needs to be fed there. But for an embedded device, it may be a different case. Um, you need access to some kind of data that's related to the operation which may not be trivial again. If it's a closed device with a closed protocol, it might be quite tricky to get to the data. And then you need to minimize the noise in the side channel. Um, if you think about power, um, and especially for an embedded device that has its own power supplies, then the power supply there is not optimized to, uh, to have low noise. Uh, actually, it's optimized to, to not have high frequency components at all in the, in the, in the power uh, channel. So you need to do something to, to make sure that the information that, that you want to find in the, in the power channel is still there and that noise is, is canceled out. And that may mean that you need to optimize the power supply for that. Um, and you need a trigger. And for instance, if you think of smart cards, the way the trigger is generated is often I'm, I'm having this, this serial channel, so I send a command in, and I can just start triggering on the last byte I send into the device. It's a very convenient point of triggering. Um, for an embedded device, this may be much more difficult. Um, it might be possible to say, well, at this point I send my data in, but the moment when the processing actually occurs may be much more uh, variable than for a smart card. So maybe you want to change the device to, to actually make an explicit trigger at some point closer to the operation so that your measurement is much more accurate in that sense. And then finally, you need to be able to link your data to your measurement. If I have like a stream of data going in and the crypto is running on that data, um, I may not be able to see which operation exactly matches with which input data. And if I'm only like one operation off, then it won't work. So you need to have kind of this 100% correlation between data and operation. Uh, again, which requires often that you prepare your target to have this linkage instead of running it on a, uh, like a, a let's say, a, a, a DVB descrambling system that's just running on the fly um, and trying to do that side channel analysis. So I already said I'm, I'm comparing a lot of things with smart cards. Um, basically, to recap on a smart card, it's a very standardized device. Um, you have kind of pads uh, on, on the device, and they're all defined. And even the protocols that they talk on these uh, interfaces are often all defined. So while it is still an embedded device, and you can compare it to microcontrollers, um, it's a very, very well-defined device compared to a generic embedded system. 
So that's why everything we know from smart cards doesn't really apply directly to embedded systems. So what I tried to do is actually make some tables and comparing these things. And actually, I don't want to go over these tables in too much detail now. Um, I've got quite a few slides left, but maybe to just kind of highlight the areas. So in this sense, you see that, that smart cards may be easier in some areas, and embedded systems may be easier in other areas. Um, embedded systems, we find generally the chips don't have countermeasures, uh, and smart cards almost always do, um, especially the, the modern ones. Um, in embedded systems, we have hardware and software implementations a lot. And software implementation tend to leak a lot more information than hardware implementations. So in some areas, embedded systems are easier um, or better protected. And in other cases, a smart card. And it's kind of not a really um, um, a clear situation which is easier or, or, or more difficult. If you look at the acquisition side, um, actually the, 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 the the easier device, of course, is a smart card because it's well defined. It has a very well defined area. However, one area where an embedded system may be you know, more flexible is where you can gain control over the device. So uh, you can imagine that a lot of chips have these internal secure hardware storage, a key, and even the software cannot get to the key. So people say, well, we don't need to you know, take so much care of that software. So gaining access to the software on the device is actually not the most difficult part of the attack. Um, but it allows you to configure the device a lot better than a smart card where you will not gain control of the device. And if you do, then probably the game's over anyway. So um, when you actually gain control, then you can start tuning your device. You can, you can optimize your device for the site channel attack. And then the picture again becomes more you know, uh, mingle, because then I can uh, have a trigger very close to my crypto operation. I can link the data very well to the crypto operation. Um, I can turn off clocks or tune the power um, very well to, to make it less noisy. So I can make a, a better platform. And because it's very fast, so the, the clocks are generally much faster, I can actually do my acquisition faster. So to give an idea of, of smart cards, so we do Acquisition on smart cards, they, they, you do a few hundred thousands a day, maybe 500,000. But for uh, fast um, chips, like, like uh, a few hundred megahertz chips with a hardware uh, crypto engine, we can do millions a day, like easily three to five million a day. So that improves your statistical attack uh, significantly uh, and, and reduces your, your attack time. So again, the, the, the picture is very mixed. It's not easy to say which is worse, and especially not which type of processor, because I now focus more on the complex ones, but you, of course, also have the microcontrollers. OK, so this was kind of an overview of you know, what do you need to do to, to do a side channel attack, and, and, and what if you try to do it on a embedded system, um, kind of from a theoretical point of view. Um, now I want to show you more the practical side of this. Uh, and first, a note on, on the way we do testing. So my company is a test lab, so we test for, 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 for customers. Um, there's quite a big difference for what we aim to do compared to what an attacker needs to do to make a real exploit. Um, they need to start from a pure black box point of view, where we have the ability to, to optimize our attack. Um, and that's what we do. We try, we don't have to break into the device and get the software running. We get an open device and we try to only attack the crypto engine, for instance. So we can optimize our environment to, to try and calculate the cost or the effort an attacker needs to go through uh, to break a device, or even if it can be done or not. So that's also where we look for in the, um, in the uh, aspects that we, that we discuss on, on, on doing this test. Um, first of all, and actually these, these were also a little bit already um, presented in the prerequisites, we need to kind of set up the controlling of the crypto, we need to link the data, um, the, the acquisition speed and efficiency, they're, they're all uh, uh, the aspects that we need, need to take to, into account just as we start. Um, 
but then we come to the different kind of side channels that you can uh, distinguish. And, and the first one is timing. And as I showed you with the pin verification, you can use the power and EM signals to actually look at the uh, timing aspects also. If you can distinguish processing in, in, in the time, you can use this. What we see with embedded systems compared to smart cards is that we actually have a lot more um, um, like access points, like outputs, that we can use to find these, these uh, timing differences. And a good example is the Xbox. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about how that worked. Um, another thing is software. You're still running on a chip. And the chip these days, a lot of cache. And you get all kinds of dependencies. Um, you have the, the famous uh, cache timing attacks. Um, and like I said, you can increase the accuracy of the timing attack using EM and power. So what we find is that timing is a, often a risk and especially in software implementations because they have all these dependencies on all kinds of things uh, considering their timing. So they are very sensitive to this. And, and using power measurements and EM uh, make the embedded devices specifically vulnerable because a lot of things are done in software. So this picture is uh, from a website that, that deals with hacking the Xbox. And what you see here is actually a small board that's connected to the Xbox and it will do a full timing attack on the secure boot of the Xbox. And it's being used to be able to load Linux, uh, basically to downgrade the kernel and then load Linux on it. Um, and it's a, it's a small FPGA board, and it's connecting to uh, the NAND chip and to a few other peripherals on the, uh, on the device. And the way the, the, the attack works is that there is a, um, an HMAC, so it's hashing a secret key and, and, and the software, um, and comparing this to a stored value, and, this, and the comparison is timing uh, uh, sensitive. So how do you kind of try this attack then? Is, is you need to start the boot, and then time how long it takes to know where the, time, where the comparison fails. And so you have to imagine this is quite a, a slow process, and it's only one or two instructions difference, but still uh, a, f a bit of logic hardware can detect this timing difference and find uh, you know, if a byte was correct or if a byte was wrong. And that's the way it works. Now, how can they observe the timing differences? By using a diagnostic port that was present or is present on the board. It's actually uh, an 8-bit value, and, it, and it, the value means an error code. So it's posting the error code in hardware on the board. Um, and just by timing when this error code occurs, you know how long it took to do the comparison. So this shows you that just having this peripheral on the board allows you, and it's actually very difficult to make a board that doesn't allow you to do this, but it's good to, good to keep in mind that these attacks are very much facilitated by the hardware. And the solution, of course, is just to use a comparison that does not depend on the input. It's always taking the same amount of time. OK, power analysis. So how do we do power analysis? Um, like the smart card has this simple interface, but this is uh, a picture of uh, internals of a BlackBerry. Um, and well, you maybe can see it barely, but if you start to look for traces that may be power traces on this, uh, you actually don't even see traces because all the traces are done in the inner layers of the board. Um, now, this is not very representative. This is actually quite well done, but there are a lot of boards that, that have a lot of chips that are very close to each other. They have multiple power lines. It's not like this is 5 volts or 1.2 volt going in. No, it's 1.2 volt going to 6 balls on the BGA. Um, and they have like uh, 15 balls doing the, the, the ground plane. So getting access to that power line is actually not so easy anymore. Um, one of the things that you can do in the hardware itself is you can improve the quality by disabling certain power domains. Often a chip these days has a lot of power domains for its peripherals. So you can turn down the USB interface and uh, all kinds of other stuff that doesn't need to do the crypto. And it will make that the power consumptions go down a, a significant amount. So we've seen like on, on, on set box chips that we could turn down the power from like one and a half ampere or one ampere to only uh, a few hundred milliampere. Um, and that means that if it's still doing the crypto with its, same, with its low amount of power, 
that all that other power was not related to the crypto. So if you have like uh, almost an ampere less power, it's an ampere less of noise. So that's why.